25 years ago, I moved in with my cousin and her roommate and co-worker named Jose. The house was an old cement block, three bedroom, one bath house with a large fenced yard. He had two very large German shepherds that lived there and were mostly in the yard. The house is in Carmel, Florida, in a shitty packed suburban neighborhood. Nothing special. Rent was cheap, 50 bucks a week from what I remember, and the house was clean. Plus, my cousin lived there too, so I moved in. We all got along well. Everyone worked. We pretty much kept to ourselves and saw each other for a few minutes here and there. I lived there for about six months. This is the story of what caused me to move out. On a weekend night, we all happened to be off from work. We decided to invite some friends over from the pool hall that we frequented, and Jose invited some people over that worked at the pharmaceutical lab. There were probably 20 people there total. We played music and did what young people do. Eventually it got pretty late and we found ourselves talking about ghosts. We all shared stories. My cousin and I came from a pretty spooky family, so we had some good ones and everybody was really into the discussion. Jose was quiet throughout most of the conversation. He waited until we had all kind of quieted down. And then he said, you know, this house is haunted. My cousin and I shot each other a look and then both laughed because, yeah, sometimes Jose's 20 pound house cat would meow at the empty hallway, but other than that, that was it. He proceeded to tell us that there was a presence in the house, but that it mostly stayed in the shed in the backyard. This tiny little pink wooden shed that I had never even looked in. He told us he always keeps the curtains in his bedroom closed because his window faces the shed and the door to the shed will not stay shut. He has jammed it shut a million times and it always pops back open. It creeps him out. He said he could tell when it was in the house because he would wake up feeling depressed. It creeped me out. I didn't want to think that I lived with a presence, and I didn't like the idea that it was hurting my roommate. I was a tough chick in my opinion, so I was like, screw that ghost, I'll shut that door, and you won't have to keep your curtains closed anymore. I said all this because in my heart, I didn't really believe that anything was in the shed or the house. I believed we were all just messing around. So, I told them all that I was going to go outside to inspect the shed and deal with the door. Everyone followed me and while we were walking around the outside of the house, Jose told me that it was a really bad idea to mess with the shed, that whatever it was wanted that door open and I should just leave it alone. We all got out there and it was exactly what I thought it was going to be, a very worn down wooden shed that oddly kind of looked like a tiny house more than a shed. I looked inside and there was a busted lawnmower and some old paint buckets, rusty screens, and darkness. I looked around outside and found some rusty shovels in a corner of the garage. I took a shovel over to the shed. I kicked the door of the shed back into the frame. The door was closed and literally kicked into the frame, kicked shut. I took the handle of the shovel and I put it under the handle of the shed door. I shoved that into the ground. It was secure. We all went back inside. We BS'd some more, but it was late. I'm gonna say around 1 a.m. By the time we go back in and everybody said their goodbyes. We let the dogs out of their pen in the yard and locked the gate. We made sure that the front gate was secured so that they wouldn't get out, and then we straightened up the house a little and eventually we all went to bed. Sometime around 6 a.m. I woke up because I needed to use the bathroom. I opened my bedroom door, and I was sleepy, but there was a weird sound as I opened it. It startled me. It was like fingernails scraping on something coarse. I opened the door all the way, and the shovel fell in the door and hit me. I can't even put into words how I felt in that moment. That shovel had been standing against my bedroom door from the outside, and there was a tiny pile of dirt where the tip had been sat against the tile floor of the hallway. I rushed through the house to the side door, which was locked, and then out to the backyard. The shed door was wide open. 
I felt like I couldn't breathe. I ran back into the house. I immediately pounded on both Jose and my cousin's bedroom door. I was terrified and angry because I knew, I mean I absolutely knew, that one of them had done this. Now, I know that you couldn't have been there to see the reactions, but I promise you, based on them, neither of them did it. Jose literally broke down sobbing. He begged me to tell him I was lying. He begged my cousin to admit that she had done it. When neither of us took responsibility, he went to the store and got a bunch of religious candles, produced a rosary, and started trying to pray away whatever it was, or pray for me for being dumb. My Spanish wasn't even close to fluent enough to keep up with his prayers. My cousin, on the other hand, was pissed. She was ready to fight me. She was adamant that I was pulling a prank, cussed me up and down, called me a liar, said I was a child, that most of all, she didn't appreciate being woken up at 6 a.m. after a night of partying to be a pawn in my prank. When I knew that neither of them had put the shovel against the door or reopened the shed door, I was literally terrified. There was no way someone else got into the yard, past the dogs, got to the shed door, opened it, got into the locked house, and then put that shovel against my door. I didn't sleep there again without someone else in the room with me. Every moment spent there after that was beyond tense. We all kind of stopped talking to each other, and Jose and my cousin ended up in a terrible argument over a button on the stereo of all things, and she moved out within a week. It took me two weeks to find another place to live, and I never went back. This happened when I was around 9 or 10. I was staying the night at my friend Catherine's for the first time. We met the summer before, and we'd been inseparable ever since. Cat lived in this old two-story house, surrounded by woods and dirt roads. The house itself gave me an uneasy feeling when I first saw it. The shutters were falling off, the paint on the house seemed to be fading. It was an old piece of shit now that I think about it. But at the time, I was excited. I remember walking in after I stared out at the house for what seemed like 20 minutes. Surprisingly, the inside was a lot nicer than the outside, so I pushed that uneasy feeling down and just shrugged it off as nerves. I remember the smell of the house. I can't pinpoint it, but it was different, like walking into a musty room. I started to walk around just to explore my surroundings but I noticed Kat's mom watching me. I simply smiled and waved, but she just stood there, staring at me wide-eyed. I had never met her before, but I couldn't figure out why she was staring at me like that. Suddenly, Kat flew around the corner and tackled me. We both fell and started to giggle. I noticed Kat's mom out of the corner of my eye start to turn around and walk off. She was gone, just like that. Fast forward a couple of hours, Kat and I are laying on a beanbag in her room, watching Children of the Corn, which, by the way, was one of my favorite movies at the time. I grew up watching horror movies, mostly Stephen King movies or any movie my mom was watching at the time. Not her decision, mine, because I love the feeling that a good horror movie gives you. She felt the same way and that's why we clicked so much. But back to the story. Kat and I were sitting here watching this movie and suddenly the door opposite us slams closed. We both jumped, giggled, and brushed it off because, well, we were kids. Until the second time, when it creaked open and slammed again, not even seconds after the first time. Now I'm sitting there staring at this door, trying to figure out how the hell this door is opening and closing by itself. In the midst of all that, the only other person in this house is her mom, who, I had figured out earlier, was just a tad bit creepy. You think it's just your mom? I asked her, but she just shook her head. Are you sure? I asked again. But then she said something that gave me chills, and still gives me chills thinking about it now. My mom isn't home, it's just me and you, silly. I just stared at her while she was staring at me, 
trying to wrap my head around what she had just said. Who leaves their nine-year-old home alone with a friend they've never met in a two-story house? Where's your mom? I asked her. She's at work. I giggled, thinking that she was trying to trick me. She is at work. She only works for a couple of hours, so she leaves me here because she trusts me. At this point, I'm just looking at her and she notices the look of worry on my face. What's wrong? She asked. If your mom is at work, then who was the lady staring at me earlier? As I said this, we heard what seemed like footsteps at the time. But thinking about it now, it sounded more like shuffling in one spot above us. I'm completely scared at this point. Every hair on my neck is standing up, and I just want to leave. I started to get up when Kat pulled me back down and asked me if I heard that noise. I nodded. It was silent again until the footsteps were back, but louder and faster. We both stared up at the ceiling and she grabbed my hand. This happens every day, she whispered. I look over at her and I can truly see the fear on her face. The footsteps stopped and she looked at me, her face flushed white. Is there an attic? I asked. She pointed up toward the ceiling. Well, maybe it's just squirrels or birds, I kept thinking, over and over. You ever notice when you're really quiet, that's when you can hear almost everything around you? Imagine if you're sitting in a house with your best friend alone at 10 years old and you hear the giggle of a three-year-old child. Mind you, she has no younger brothers or sisters and we're completely alone. Kat was just as scared as I was. I remember thinking that I just wanted to get out of this house, just grab her and run out the door. At least we would feel safer and less scared outside the house than in it. Wanna hear a story? Kat asked, pulling my mind back to reality. I nodded. Well, this house used to be a daycare. There was this lady that would watch the kids and one day she just locked them in the attic and then hung herself from a rope in the kitchen. They all died because the kids were hungry and thirsty and no one found them for months afterwards. It was this house. My heart started to pound and my eyes were wide with fear. I just looked at her. It's true, she said. I've seen them, the little kids, every day. But I've never seen the lady. You have though, earlier. After she told me this, I don't remember much else except running out the door of her room and making it outside the house. Cat followed, begging me to stay, but I just had to get out. My stomach felt like it was in knots, like I'd walked into a horror movie myself, and I just wished the entire day had never happened. Fast forward years later. That day was the last day I had seen or heard from Cat. I remember her always coming to play outside my dad's during the day. I remember what she looked like. I never remembered meeting her parents or seeing them out in public, though. I'm now 27, and I can't seem to find any proof that she exists. All my friends that I was friends with then, I'm still friends with now, even after all these years. So why not her? I've driven by that house maybe 15 times, and I still wonder if maybe, just maybe, she was one of the kids that never made it out. When I was a teenager, my family moved into a new house in Ohio. Well, it was new to us. As soon as we moved in, my mother started saying that she felt the house was haunted and that she could sense a presence there. She said she heard somebody call her name and felt somebody put a hand on her shoulder. One time she woke up with somebody holding her feet down and she couldn't shake off whatever it was, so she started screaming. She also heard muffled voices. We didn't believe her at all, until both my sister and I started experiencing strange things. My first experience was when I was reading a book in my bedroom at 3 a.m. 
I'm a night owl, so this wasn't that unusual. Everyone should have been asleep, but suddenly I hear very heavy footsteps right outside my bedroom door. They were too heavy to be my mom's or my sister's, so I just assumed that my dad was walking around, checking up on us. I sprinted to the door, and when I opened it, I was shocked to discover the hallway was dark and nobody was up. Our attic had several feet of fluffy insulation covering the entire area. There was nothing stored there, but at times you could hear steps coming from the attic, running up to the side of the house. They always ran up to the side with the driveway, as though they were trying to see who arrived, and this happened almost every time that somebody would pull up to the house. In the daytime, it was almost cool, but in the nighttime, it was terrifying. There was always something clicking loudly under my bed and in the closet at night, and I always tried to convince myself it was the air vents. However, all the air vents were on the other side of the bedroom and they never made clicking noises. I sometimes saw an outline of a person standing next to my bed if my head was covered with a sheet, but when I pulled the sheet off, nobody was there. I heard sighs, as though somebody was standing right behind me. And one time, I heard a whisper that said, Come play. I prayed a lot, and that usually helped. I would also ask them to quiet down, and that helped as well. One time, my boyfriend and I were doing homework in the basement and heard the garage door open and voices of my parents in the kitchen. We ran up to say hi, only to discover an empty house. Another time, my boyfriend stayed overnight in our house and he slept in the living room. In the morning, he asked if we were all playing a joke on him at night, as he kept hearing a ball bounce on the stairwell leading up to the bedrooms on the second floor and in the kitchen. But every time he got up to see what was going on, no one was there. I don't think we even owned a ball and we certainly didn't play with one in the house. One time, my mom heard a baby crying outside of our house at night. We lived in a safe and perfectly normal suburb. There was no reason that a baby would be in our backyard. Another day, a lid flew off of a cooking pot and got halfway embedded into the kitchen ceiling. It wasn't a pressure cooker. It was just a regular lid and pot. Another time, we left for a family vacation and my boyfriend was asked to take our paper in. He said that he was in the house and decided to make my bed for me. We had left at the ungodly hour of 5 a.m. and I never got to it. He said at first he got a juice and felt like somebody was breathing down his neck in the kitchen. He kept turning around to find nobody there. Then he walked upstairs and while he was making my bed, he felt something grab his legs from under it. He got freaked out and ran out of there and he refused to enter the house again. He just diligently hid the papers behind a flower pot outside until we returned. One night, my sister woke up to a black caped figure standing silently in her room. She said there was also a bright orb near her window. Her windows faced the backyard and trees, and being on the second floor, there was no possible source of light from cars and things like that. She covered her head with the blanket, and when she looked out, the figure and the orb were still there. She went back under the blanket, and after some time, they were finally gone. One day, our cat disappeared without a trace, and we never did see it again. Not sure if that was related. My dad was one person who never experienced anything. No voices, no steps, no TV and radios blasting out on their own. He is hard of hearing, so that could be a factor. But one thing he can't explain is waking up at 4 a.m. next to a lit tea light candle that he swears burnt out at midnight. The candle was right in front of his face, and he's extremely sensitive to light, to the point where he covers any electronic lights with napkins because they disturb his sleep. It eventually got so bad that I refused to sleep in my own bedroom, as I could feel someone move around the room at night and I slept in my sister's room. 
My dad decided to call a medium, and the guy said that there were five spirits in the house, a boy, an old lady, a couple, and a very angry man. He gave us a giant candle with a cross and said to burn it in the bedroom of the youngest child, which was now also my bedroom where I slept in a sofa chair. The candle was in a big glass jar and was hefty. All night it kept shaking and the glass kept making clicking noises against the counter that it stood on. We were also to tell the spirits that this was our house and that they needed to go to the light. Things improved after the visit and shortly after I moved out to attend college, where I slept for years with the lights on, although I never experienced any paranormal activity in my apartment there. After college, I never stayed in the house for longer than a few days, always sleeping with the lights on, as that creepy feeling remained, although nothing notable happened anymore. Eventually, my parents sold the house. Where I live, we have had relatively few bid cases. There were almost none at all back in the fall. Because of that, although we were still living under certain restrictions, we had more public health sanctioned freedoms than many other places. For example, at the time, we were permitted to share our social bubble with one other household and travel within our region. My family and our fellow bubble family decided to take advantage of this by going on a fall getaway. We rented two side-by-side -side cabins in a beautiful waterfront wooded area and had a lovely relaxing weekend. Although there were other cabins nearby, most were not occupied and we saw no other people, although we did hear a dog barking a few times somewhere not far off. On our final night there, my son decided to sleep in the other cabin with his bubble siblings. Around 11 p.m., he called over, asking for some forgotten thing. It was a very dark night, and there were certainly no streetlights in the deeply wooded cabin area. So I grabbed my flashlight and walked the short distance to the neighboring cabin to deliver whatever it was that he needed. On the walk back, I heard a whistle. It was a very human sounding whistle, exactly the kind of whistle one makes to call in a dog. It sounded very close, but shining my light around, I saw nobody. I heard it again and assumed someone was whistling for the dog we'd heard earlier, so I didn't think much of it. A short time later, another call came from next door. My son couldn't settle and wanted to come back to our cabin. This time, my husband and I both walked over, collected our child and his stuff, said goodnight to our bubble family and walked back. We heard the same whistle again, several times. It seemed to be on the dirt road ahead of us, moving gradually away. My husband commented that the dog must have gotten loose and the owner was out looking for it. Inside our cabin, we continued to hear the whistling coming at irregular intervals of maybe two to four minutes. At first, it would be loud and seemed quite nearby. Then it would gradually grow fainter, then stop as though the whistler had moved out of earshot. Then it would seem to circle around, coming from the other direction, getting louder as it moved past our cabin, then fading again into the distance then it would start all over again. Still not thinking much of it, my husband climbed into the loft to go to sleep while I started to pack for the trip home the next day. Our son was sleeping in a little room on the main floor to the left of the front door and the small window in his room was cracked open to let in the unseasonably warm night air. I was standing by that window, quietly gathering his scattered things while the whistle once again drew closer. But this time, instead of fading as it passed by, the next one was very close and incredibly loud, 
as though the whistler was just outside my son's window. The blind was down, but I was sure someone was on the porch right outside. I leapt to the front door, flung it open and threw on the porch light, ready to tell off some prankster on our doorstep. Nobody was there. I grabbed my flashlight and took a few steps out past the circle of light, then thought better of it and retreated inside. I locked up the cabin, closed and latched all the windows and lowered all the blinds. If someone was creeping around outside our cabin, I didn't want them looking in at us from the darkness. Deciding that I did not want to leave my sleeping son downstairs by himself, I settled on the sofa with a book. The whistles continued. Between each one, I would convince myself it was just a bird or an animal, only to hear it again and be certain that it could only be a human sound. The irregularity of it and the slight variations in pitch and tone also told me that it wasn't something mechanical or electrical or automated. Around 1.30 in the morning, my husband suddenly got up and started to get dressed. I asked him what he was doing. I'm going to find out whoever that is and ask them why they've been whistling for hours, he said. I was horrified. My husband is a pretty big guy and I was as curious as he was, but I also felt deep in my bones that it would not be safe for him to go outside that night. I insisted that he go back to bed, and thankfully he did. I sat vigil, listening to the intermittent whistles for at least another hour, until finally I dozed off on the sofa. When I awoke, it was morning. The sun was peeking around the blinds, and the whistling had stopped. I cautiously peered outside, half expecting to see some sort of evidence of a nightmare intruder but there was none. A little while later, we wandered next door, coffee mugs in hand, to get our friend's take on the mystery whistler. Amazingly, they had not heard a thing, despite the fact that the sound was so clearly audible in our cabin and would have had to have passed right by them. We couldn't understand how they hadn't heard it. At checkout, I asked the woman at the kiosk down the road about it but she just looked at me strangely and said she didn't know what it could have been. When I got home, I searched for audios of bird calls common to the area and then ones not common to the area in the hope of finding that same whistle. Nothing I found was even close and we still don't know what we heard that night, circling for hours and stopping just outside our cabin door. This is my story about a haunted doll named Claire. She's been featured in the book Haunted Objects, Stories of Ghosts on Your Shelves, on a couple of paranormal podcasts, and the TV show Haunted Towns that aired on Destination America back in 2017. You can still catch reruns of the show on Travel Channel every now and then. She was in the season finale, featuring McDonough, Georgia. Here's my story. As an eight-year-old child, I was given an old porcelain doll by a very dear family friend, Miss Marion. She was all the time coming across things and giving them to me. This doll was the last thing she gave me. I was never really into dolls at all growing up, but I took the doll and placed her in my room in a small child-sized rocking chair. The chair sat next to my closet and dresser right beside my nightlight. The doll was very pretty. She was dressed in a peach and cream colored dress with an apron and petticoats. She had little black Mary Jane shoes that, when removed, showed her delicately painted toenails. Her body was soft. Only her head, forearms, hands, and legs from the knee down were porcelain. Her lips were pink, and her dark brown hair hung in slightly frizzed and now loose curls. 
Her eyes were brown, her cheeks were a rosy peach color, all like mine. Miss Marion made a point of saying that the doll reminded her of me, which is why she gave her to me. From the moment that that doll, which I named Claire, came into my house, things began to happen. I was always uneasy with Claire. I never wanted to touch her, and when I played in my room, it was as if she watched me. It wasn't anything to panic about, but I do remember feeling like if I did something wrong, she might actually tell on me. How ridiculous does that sound? My first real occurrence that I remember was when I was reading in my room, ghost stories actually, when a musical carousel horse that sat on my dresser began to play. Not just a couple of notes like old mechanical music boxes will do from time to time, but like somebody just wound it up fully. I sat stunned and stared at the little horse as it moved up and down in time with the music. Then it just stopped. It didn't wind down, it just stopped. I was a pretty brave kid. I didn't run and I didn't tell my mom. I used to see a shadow man in the hallway or in my parents' bedroom door all growing up. And if she didn't believe me about that, she wouldn't believe me about something as mundane as a music box playing on its own. So I just let it go. The next thing that happened was the voice. For several nights, and on into these years, I was awoken by what sounded like a woman, inches from my face, shouting my name. Jill, wake up. I would jump up and sit up to find my room empty. Those happenings died down after a few months. She then started to plague my little brother with the same thing, and now that he and I are grown and gone, she's moved on to my dad. The little things started to get to me. I'd put something in a certain place, only to find it later on on the floor or on my dresser, right next to Claire. All of my missing items eventually turned up around her. Once, a ring ended up in the pocket of her apron. Books would fall off my shelves, and a perfume smell would sometimes fill my room. The doll itself didn't smell at all, but the air around her would. My catalyst to finally getting Claire out of my room was the night I woke up after hearing thumping around in my closet. I opened my eyes, sat up in bed, and of course my eyes were drawn to the nightlight where Claire sat. I realized that it wasn't coming from in the closet, but near it. As I watched, the source of the thumping became clear. The rocking chair that Claire occupied was rocking on its own. I had thick shag carpet, so there was no way this thing was just rocking by chance. If that wasn't enough, Claire's feet, which were both turned to the side facing opposite each other, slowly straightened themselves to both be pointing directly up. Twenty years later, this part still freaks me out. Then, she turned her head, which was quite impossible to do since it was attached, fixed, to her cloth body. She looked toward me and every music box in my room, four of them to be exact, started to play all at once. I was frozen with fear. I didn't feel endangered so much as I just felt scared of what was happening. I screamed for my mom and dad. The music stopped, but Claire maintained her gaze in my direction. And this is why I hate dolls. Even after that, I couldn't get rid of Claire totally. I ended up stuffing her in a box in the back of a storage closet. She's still there as far as I know. So is the woman who now screams my dad's name in the middle of the night. While I think she explains some of the oddities that happen in my parents' house, I don't think she's the tie to all of it, especially the shadow man. My friend Tim Weisberg is a paranormal radio and podcast host of the show Spooky South Coast, and also is an author. He asked me to lend him Claire once. He heard my story back in 2011. I obliged and Claire went to stay with him for a few months. 
He wrote about his experiences with Claire while she stayed with him in the book Haunted Objects that I mentioned earlier. Temperature changes in the room that she stayed in, along with hearing voices, were two of his noted encounters. Claire also stayed briefly at the Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast in 2012. The guys from the Haunted Towns show encountered some things in my parents' house while Claire was with them. So this happened last year in Virginia, and is also the reason I never backpack alone anymore. I was taking summer courses at the time, and we ended up with a three-day weekend in June. So I thought it was a great time to go explore some of the Virginian wilderness. I did a Google search, found a state park with a trail that looked nice, and let my roommate and family know the trail I was going to be on. When I got close to the park area, I saw a little outdoor shop where people hiking the Appalachian Trail stop. I went in to grab a map of the area, just in case I got lost. As I was talking to the owner, he mentioned a trail that's not well known that has a pretty cool waterfall and a swimming hole. This piqued my interest, so I had him show me on the map. It took me outside the state park but he said it was a great place to go. I paid for the map and thanked the owner. I texted my roommate and my parents about the new trail, and I parked my car and set off on my adventure. I should note that the waterfall was going to be a side trip from my journey. I was planning three days and two nights. I started on part of the Appalachian Trail, and it was pretty packed with people, and some of them are really fun to talk to. As expected, I got further and further from the main trails, and I saw fewer and fewer people. Around early afternoon, three miles from my destination, I noticed it was unnaturally silent. No birds. No bugs. Not even wind. And I had the distinct feeling of being watched. I shook it off as me overanalyzing the situation. I got to the waterfall, and it wasn't too spectacular, but it was cool to look at. Plus, it had a good size area to swim in, so naturally I stripped down to my skivvies and took a dip. It was pretty refreshing. As I was getting my clothes back on, I started whistling to myself. That's when I heard something whistle the same tune back. I thought it was a bird copying me, so I went back and forth with it and it would repeat whatever I whistled. I thought it was pretty neat. As I was setting up camp, I couldn't shake this feeling that I was being watched again. Like I would get goosebumps and my hair would stand up on end. As night fell, I built a small fire and lit my jet boil to make some dinner. As I did this, I became hyper aware that again, there was no sound just deafening silence. Some part of my brain was telling me that I wasn't safe and that I should leave. I ignored it and crawled into my tent with my flashlight and book. I went to sleep without incident. When I woke up the next morning, my sight was trashed. My camp stool was nowhere to be found. My bear bag with my food was cut down and the contents were thrown across the site. My first thought was that a crafty animal had chewed through the rope and got the bag. But I looked at the rope, and it was cut with something very sharp. Plus, none of the food was even touched. I also noticed bare footprints, human footprints, all around my campsite. Keep in mind, I'm at least six to eight miles from any road. As I was looking at the mess, I heard a branch snap off in the distance. I turned to look in that direction. I saw nothing. But I heard that whistling again. My whistle from yesterday. But it was different. It sounded more sinister. It made my hair stand on end 
And this is when I listened to my instincts to get the hell out of there. It sounded like it was a little off in the distance, so I packed up my camp as fast as I could. As I did, the whistling got closer and closer as I finally finished stuffing the tent into my bag. I didn't even bother with putting anything away properly. I just wanted to get out. The whistling was incessant and sounded like it was coming from all directions. I got fed up with it and finally I stood and yelled into the woods, Shut up! What the hell do you want? It stopped whistling and it was quiet for a moment. And then it repeated everything I had just said in my voice. It sounded just like me, but distorted like it was coming from an old television. After I heard this, I immediately threw my pack on and ran in the direction I'd come from. I heard it moving just behind me, fast switching between the whistle and my voice. It felt like it was toying with me, not coming too close, but never being too far. Eventually, it sounded like it got farther and farther away from me, and then it suddenly stopped. When it stopped, I stopped and turned around. I wish I never had, because I heard the most bone-chilling screech I've ever heard coming from right next to me. That's when I started running again. I didn't look, I just ran. Less than a half mile, I ran into a couple that was also backpacking. They saw the look of terror on my face and asked if it was me that had screamed and asked if I was okay. I told them about what happened and they decided not to go down from where I had just come from. We moved to a more populated trail and as quickly as we could, all got the hell out of there. As soon as I got back in my car, I drove to one of the park's ranger stations and reported what had happened. Since the site was off park grounds, they told me it wasn't in their jurisdiction, but that they would send a ranger to investigate. The ranger station's parking lot runs right up to the woods. As I was getting into my jeep, I hear the whistling coming from the woods just in front of me. I've been debating with myself for months whether or not I should tell this story. And today, I finally feel like it's time. I need to tell people about this, and I need someone that knows about this to hear it. I lived in a farm around four years ago. From the moment we moved there, I could tell something was wrong. I felt uneasy in there, as if there was something constantly spying on me. A little detail about the place and situation. We didn't technically own the place. It was borrowed from a woman that was trying to sell it. Call it a demo. So we didn't have access to the house and we slept in a wooden storage house. The farm itself was like this. There was a barbed wire gate that you manually had to move in the entrance and in front of it, there was an open empty field with one of those outside washrooms to the right. Passing by it, there was a small group of trees and then the place where we slept. Passing that was the actual house to the left and then the forest. In the forest entrance, there was a tree with a ripped plastic bag tied to its branches, meaning the bag was tied while it was still small. People used to do that here to mark something and right in front of it, there was a mound. Someone buried something there. I moved there with four dogs, plus there was the dog that already lived there that we took care of. Our routine was to wake up at 5 a.m. and to go into the city so I could go to school and my parents could go to work. The first night we stayed there, I noticed my room was the only one in the entire house that didn't have a lock. I couldn't sleep because of the weird feeling I had. 
I stayed up all night and slept on my way to school. Then things got weirder. The door started opening at night. I dismissed it as the wind, cliche I know, but it became more frequent and more violent. Then, still in the very first week, I saw it. It was a black humanoid figure with a white face. It was like the white face had empty eye sockets and instead of a mouth, just had an empty cavity on its face. It stood on my door entrance, staring at me. I decided I would not sleep while I lived there. I couldn't bring myself to move or do anything. So I just kept staring at it, trying to convince myself that it was just my mind playing tricks on me. Some nights later, it became impossible to pretend because it started moving and doing things. It entered my room. It tapped on the window. It was a metal window that was right beside my bed. It started to slightly move things and kept being a general creep. Whenever I flashed a light on it, it disappeared, but the eerie feeling stayed there. I started keeping a flashlight in my room and playing music to keep myself awake and calm. Eventually, of course, I started falling asleep during the day, and on some days I woke up with headaches and the feeling that my eyes had been pushed into my skull. I woke up with pain. Eventually, my parents got security cameras, because while we were in the city, some people entered the place to go fishing. There was a shortcut to the neighboring farm's lake through the forest. This is important because of what happened next. Then one day my aunt went to visit. She had some weird superstitions and said that the place had gold buried on it for some reason. She went to the forest and saw the mound under the marked tree I talked about before and she decided it was a good idea to unbury it. And so we did. Bad idea. There's a certain feeling of digging dirt that differs from rocks or mud or clay. I learned that this day as I dug the hole. Then, after going through a small layer of fragmented rocks, I hit something soft and resistant that felt like leather. I hit it harder and pushed through it. Immediately after it, there was something hard with a complex and detailed shape. I tried to break through it since my aunt insisted it was protection for the gold and my parents were just whipping me into helping her, but it was no use and it occupied most of the area of the hole so we couldn't dig around it. It was like the hole was made specifically to bury it. My aunt said then that we should cover the hole. She didn't cover it and went home. That night was hell. There was no tapping on the window. There was a strong banging. The thing kept entering my room nonstop and even the flashlight stopped working. I had to stay awake, feeling everything just pressuring me, pressing in on all sides. My door wouldn't close. That thing would make noise and it would just be there, staring at me. All the security cameras stopped working the moment that it all started. There were four cameras, one pointing to the front of the house, one pointing to the washroom, one on the back that showed my window and one that pointed to the forest. That morning, I went to check the camera footage and all the cameras had stopped working, except for the one pointing to the forest. There was only static for all the other three, but that one just had a small blur. After that night, it never appeared again. I still couldn't sleep out of the fear, but it never actually showed up again and things got calmer. We moved out some time after that. I keep thinking about it even now, four years later. It was just too real. And there were things that were noticed by other people too. I especially keep thinking about that thing we hit while digging and how that night was the worst. I keep asking myself if maybe we found a body or something haunted that was hidden for a good reason.
I grew up in a house on a rural back road, and looking back on it now in my adult life, I feel like there was a lot of dark energy in the house. There were a few events that happened to me and others while living in that house that I will never forget. This is one of the experiences that happened to my brother and I. For backstory, I lived in a very small rural city with a thousand people on an island, in an area rich with dense forests, vast hay fields, and roads that go on and on to seemingly nowhere. Truthfully, I was a very strong-minded kid who, oddly enough, would adventure into the woods all day alone. Or we would play hide-and-seek outside at nighttime around our property. Some nights, I would even go outside and just lay in my yard and watch the stars. None of that bothered me, but I was scared of my house. My little brother, who shared this one particular experience with me, slept with his bedroom light on his entire childhood. I spent a lot of time sneaking into my parents' room during the night to feel safer. I never liked going into the basement by myself. I avoided the wood room in our basement as much as I could, and I also didn't like being home alone. This whole event happened over two minutes on a summer day. I was 15, and my brother was 11. My parents were at work, which was normal and I remember my brother and I laying on our couch. We were home alone, watching TV in the living room, and sitting about six feet away from the landing of a flight of stairs, which goes to the second floor. In my house, once at the top of the L-shaped stairs, there's a door directly ahead of you, a door to the right, and an empty hallway to the left with four other doors and other rooms. There's nothing in the hallway, just light bulbs and switches, while watching TV, I heard a noise upstairs, a muffled thud. Just the wind. That's what you instinctively tell yourself, right? We continued to watch TV, and at this point, my brother hadn't even acknowledged or noticed the first noise, but I had, because it was so strange. Then, the same sounding noise came again. It wasn't one single sound, but a couple of sounds tied together that made it seem more intentional. The noise wasn't anything I could pinpoint, but it did sound like a brief second of furniture moving very slightly. That was enough to scare me, and my brother could tell at this point that I was very focused on the stairs and not the television. These noises were not extremely loud, but definitely not something created by wind. I was nervous, and I muted the television for a moment, so the house was basically silent. After one more thud from upstairs, I was petrified, and I started to sit up a bit. My brother was also beginning to become more alert and nervous. I remember him saying something to reassure me, and we both sat up. He began to say something else as I was trying to listen acutely and figure out what the hell was going on upstairs. I snapped, listen. At that second, a much, much louder and closer series of sharp, crashing sounds occurred. This time, it was so loud and sudden that when it happened instinctively, we both jumped up and started to run out of the living room through the kitchen as quickly as we could. We tried to run outside and get out of the house. I tried to open the door and it wouldn't budge, almost like it was locked. But it wasn't locked. Because the knob still moved, it just wouldn't push open. I don't think that the door has ever acted like that before, or since. I started to run to the sunroom, where the French doors led outside, and my brother followed. While we both ran full tilt to the other doors, on the way, I looked into the living room. And at the base of the stairs, I saw an out-of-place faux glass drinking cup. I realized that it was the source of the last sharper crashing sound because it had hit the walls in the staircase before tumbling down the last stairs and landing in the living room. Trying to figure out how it had gotten from a bedroom or bathroom to the bottom of the stairs still scares me to this day. I have no explanation of what created the energy to cause the noises and for the glass to travel the distance it did. There was another strange moment in that event because when we got to the other doors, 
I'll never forget in the half second it took me to unlock that door. My eyes were locked on a housefly that was alive and buzzing inside the glass. It got smeared against the window pane of the door as if something had swatted it right in front of me, but nothing was there. And even if somebody had been, nobody could have reached it because it was between the glass. It was so sinister and shocking to see the once living fly get smushed before my very eyes as if an invisible force had put pressure on it. When I opened the door, we continued to run barefoot the fifty or so feet as fast as we could to our neighbor's house, who's also my Aunt Michelle. We instinctively ran as quickly as we could, and we felt much safer there. We didn't bother to explain it in detail, until my aunt asked what happened, and we just said something had scared us. I remember her laughing at us because she thought that we were overreacting. It was really hard to sleep in that house that night. And I bet my life my brother slept with the light on. And I did too. Maybe five years ago, we were talking about scary things amongst friends. And I asked him, Do you remember the day we were so scared that we ran over to Michelle's house? He replied laughing with, Nope, we were scared a lot back in the day. I left it at that. I'm staying at his condo right now. And he's sleeping beside me peacefully, with the lights out. I'm tempted to ask him again what he remembers from that day, or any of the things that he remembers happening in our home, but I don't want to bring it up. I want to keep those memories out of his head, and I think he does too, and I definitely don't want new memories in mine. A lot of times I wish I didn't remember some of the things, because I don't like revisiting those memories myself. But that house, and that day in particular, was terrifying. Last summer, a good friend and I embarked on a backpacking trip through the White Mountain National Forest in New Hampshire. As fairly experienced day hikers, we felt comfortable in the Whites for our inaugural overnight trip. While planning, my buddy Ellis figured we could hike to a backcountry campsite to make our first wilderness night a little more fun. I wasn't going to disagree. Beautiful views, historic trails, and a protected night in the dry river wilderness. I was stoked to say the least. Before any hiking trip, I do a little internet search on the trails or shelters that I will be coming across. Throughout the mid to late 1900s, there were a series of these lean-tos up and down the dry river wilderness, meant for backpackers or through hikers really looking to escape the crowds in more popular areas of the forest. Though as time went on and the Forest Service had other more pressing matters, many of these shelters were dismantled, except for dry river shelter number three, the last remaining shelter in this wilderness zone. On the morning of our hike, I met Ellis at the trailhead, and we set off. The sky was overcast, bringing with it a dense fog throughout the forest. The weather left us with nearly no visibility, so there went our stunning views. At least the trail consisted of prime, technical New England rock scrambling alongside the river. Ellis and I made it up to the Presidential Ridge, stopping by the Lakes of the Clouds. The hut was filled with day hikers, backpackers, and through hikers, all socializing together. We were even rewarded with some sun and a brief glimpse of the Dry River Valley on the summit of Mount Monroe before the fog rolled back in. With dwindling views and a stiff wind, Ellis and I hustled below the tree line down to the Dry River Shelter Number 3, our home for the night. Once we dropped off the ridge into the valley, we enter the wilderness zone where rangers patrolled sparingly. Time to really be alone in the wild. As we trekked into the wilderness, all signs of civilization disappeared, and the trail was densely overgrown. Although it had been raining all week, there were no footprints in the mud either. At least we would have some relaxing isolation, I figured. After about an hour or so of descending, Ellis spotted the lean-to, just as our legs were asking for relief. A gorgeous old timber structure with a well-used fire pit alongside a cold mountain river. Pristine camping. As we settled in and explored the site, 
I found a small, bound notebook nestled into the corner of the structure. On the cover, someone wrote, Dry River Shelter Number 3. Out of curiosity, I opened it, but I found nothing more than a lone man's name scribbled onto the first page, and a date. Just your standard camping log. Oddly, though, the man signed the book the previous day. We saw no footprints or signs of humans, or even animals. No disturbances on the trails or here at the shelter. The rain can wash away tracks, but not all signs of life. Something felt off to me. I showed it to Ellis, who found it curious, but thought nothing more of the single name. He convinced me that the man was probably a hiking veteran and a professional at LNT. I bought into Ellis's thoughts on the situation to ease my mind. As the sun set, we started a roaring fire alongside the riverbank. Ellis commented how quiet the location was, having not seen another soul beyond the chirp of birds since leaving the Crawford Path. The silence was eerie, but we figured that city life had desensitized us to the wild. The sun was setting and we grew tired with the darkness. Ellis took the lean-to and I spent the night in my tent. Sleep came quickly after hiking over eight miles with 20 pounds on my back, but this didn't last long. A brutally sharp slapping noise woke me. The only thing I could compare the noise to would be someone swinging a two by four into a tree or snapping a thick branch. I figured it was a bear searching for our food bag hanging in a tree some 20 to 50 yards away. Nothing out of the ordinary for New Hampshire. Sleep overtook me once again, and I remember waking up to the sun rising over the peaks. I stumbled out of my tent to see Ellis also waking up slowly. As we made our morning oats and coffee, I wandered around the site again to see if I could find the marks that the bear had left. Instead, I noticed something odd. The small notebook was open. I swear that I put it back where I found it, closed and in the back corner of the shelter not open and on the floor. Hey, Ellis, were you checking out this camp log last night? Nah, man, I passed out, he said. It's not like there's anything to read in it anyway. You sure? I commented as I bent over to pick it up. The lone hiker's name was not so lonely anymore. At least 20 more names filled the pages. The lone traveler, whose name was originally on the first page, could now be found several pages deep into the notebook. I tossed it to Ellis, whose face instantly dropped the second his mind registered what he was looking at. Great, now I knew it wasn't just some dehydration delusion of the previous day. Dude, we must have been seeing things last night, he said. There's no way we missed all these names. How could we? This is when I began to tell Ellis about the slapping noise during the night. I received nothing other than instant denial. These sounds were not the result of some hooligans or backward crazies harassing us. Ellis was convinced. Rather sternly, he said, It's a bear, Jack. It's just a bear. Let's go now. And, well, go we did. Ellis led us out of the sight and on our way home not ten minutes later. A year has passed, and I'm still not quite sure what happened during our night at the Dry River Shelter Number 3. The memory of seeing a single name written on the front page of the notebook is so crisp in my mind. I couldn't have mistaken it. Could I have mistaken the noises I heard and the new additions to the book? Ellis feels the same way about the whole scenario. What do you think? Could we have just been too dehydrated and delusional and saw the same thing independently? Or were we not welcomed by the New Hampshire wilderness? At the time that this happened, I didn't really know what was going on. I just had the impression that the woods outside of my house were very creepy. I only recently decided that I think it was a Bigfoot, after doing a lot of research and seeing a lot of similarities between my own story and other people's stories who have had encounters. 
My family started building a house in rural South Georgia when I was 12, and we moved in once it was finished a few months after I turned 13. It was a few miles outside of the town we lived in, a plantation town on the Florida-Georgia border. We lived there until I graduated from high school in 2013. The first thing I don't actually remember happening, but my dad told me about it a few months ago. Apparently the first night my family slept in the new house, when none of the windows had curtains or blinds yet, I came into my parents' bedroom and asked to sleep with them. I did this a lot as a little kid, but it was pretty unusual by the time I was 13. My dad said that I told him I saw a face looking into my window, and that it scared me. The rest of all of this I remember pretty clearly. One time, my sister and I were jumping on a trampoline in our backyard, and all of a sudden we heard something whistle at us. It came from the side of the house, near our garage. I can't explain exactly why it was so terrifying, but it scared us to death. We jumped off the trampoline and sprinted inside, slamming the door behind us. It was just so weird, because we had already met the neighbors at that point, and we didn't have many and it didn't make sense that they would hide from us and whistle. They would have just walked up to us. Plus, we hadn't seen any people approaching. My sister has told me that she saw something hiding behind the trash can next to the house, but I didn't see that. She doesn't remember the whistling part, but I swear I'll never forget it. It was just so bizarre. I think that she might have seen something and remembered what she saw, while I only remembered what I heard. Sometimes I think that I remember seeing a dog or something run to the side of the house from the woods, like, super fast. But I don't know for sure if that actually happened. Anyway, that was one of the single freakiest things that has ever happened to me. I know it sounds mundane, but in the moment, it was bone-chilling, and I still get chills thinking about it. Anyway, after that, my dad decided to build a privacy fence around our backyard and we got two dogs a little bit after that. The yard was pretty big, and my sister and I were both pretty athletic. We would put on headphones and play in the yard while we listened to music, kick a soccer ball, run laps around the yard, play fetch with the dogs, things like that. Sometimes we did this with each other, and sometimes by ourselves. At night, I always thought I would see some sort of cone-shaped head looking at me over the fence. But if I did a double take to make sure that I wasn't seeing things, the head would be gone. Other times I'd be out in the yard by myself, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I would feel like I was being watched. This was always scarier to me than when I thought I saw things. I swear it was like I knew that something was watching me, and it was overwhelming. I would stop what I was doing immediately, and go inside. This happened all the time. Other times, I'd be shooting basketball in our driveway, or going for a jog through the neighborhood. It was a developing subdivision, not a house out in the woods by itself, and I would get that same freaky feeling. After we got our licenses, I think I actually saw one while I was driving. We were with another friend who also lived outside the city limits, on the way to her house. Our friend was in the front seat, and my sister was in the back seat. We were coming around this bend not too far away from our neighborhood, and all of a sudden my friend and I saw this super tall brown thing on the side of the road. It was very tall, ancient. It looked like a really old man with a long beard and a distorted face. It was slender too, not bulky. My friend and I saw it at the same time, and both said, what was that? I guess my sister was on her phone or something, because I remember that she asked us what we saw, but we'd already passed it by the time she looked out her window. My friend and I both agreed that it was a man in a mask trying to scare people, but I don't think either of us believed that. From then on out, every time I drove past that spot, I would try to see if there were any weird trees or something that we maybe could have thought was a person with a mask, but it just looked like a regular patch of woods. 
Another time, a different friend was playing with us outside as the sun was setting. We were walking down this empty road that no houses had been built on yet, and to our left was some woods with miles and miles of ATV trails. All of a sudden, he just goes, run. We didn't ask questions. We all sprinted back to the house. When we got back, he was shaken up, and he said that he saw something, but he never did tell us what it was. My sister and I are both grown now, and our parents sold the house and moved out of state when we were in college, so we haven't been back for years. But after I did some research and started putting some pieces together, I asked my sister if she thought the house we grew up in was creepy, and she said it absolutely was. She would feel like she was being watched in the yard too, and remembers seeing shadows moving in the woods. She said she'll never forget seeing something hiding behind the trash can that one time. She even independently googled Bigfoot sightings in the town we grew up in, and found an article about a rash of sightings that happened while we were in middle school. Anyway, we both believe that that's why we were so creeped out by the woods outside of our house, that there was probably a Bigfoot, maybe more than one, living out there. I never connected all of these weird things until I started listening to Bigfoot podcasts and stuff like that, but now that I've put the pieces together, I feel like I can't unsee it. I am Puerto Rican, and I live in Brooklyn, but when I was young, I often spent summers in my grandmother's house in Yauco, Puerto Rico. She had a lot of land deep in the mountains, so deep that roads would go off into the wilderness through narrow mountain passes where cliffs were just a few inches off the tire driving in pitch black. If a car came in the opposite direction, either they or you would have to drive in reverse until you found a place to pass each other. It was scary. The property has been with my family for a long time, and my family has been in Yauco as far back as anyone can recall. I used to spend a lot of time with my great-grandfather, Papito, who farmed the land and took care of some cows. He was very old, and he was nearly 100% Taino indigenous Puerto Rican. From him, I would hear stories about the Indios who lived in the wilderness when he was young, who were not culturally assimilated into colonial society after hundreds of years of Spanish occupation. My family would often hide and harbor the culturally wild Puerto Ricans, culturally indigenous, because if Spanish locals found them, Los Matan, they would kill them. I had my first brush with mortality there at age six or so, crushing the jelly bean sized eggs of salamanders I found in the brush and watching the pink underdeveloped hatchling run for cover on instinct. My grandmother told me that what I had done was very wrong and I instantly knew why. I was filled with cold shame and I cried. Papito told me about strange flying discs he would see coming to the mountains and submerging into the lake. He told me about the spirits in the valley that you could hear them, and to be careful walking around the roads of the mountains at night on my way home from his house to my grandmother's. He taught me how to control a bull with its horns and how to ride it. He did a whistle only he could do when he wanted to gain the attention of an animal on the mountain that made them either follow him, go where he directed them, or just settle down. He told me about the legend of Diego Salcedo, which took place there in Yauco. When he was almost 100, Papito was dying, and all of our family came to see him. He was a link to an old time, and so many people in Yauco knew him. They all went to his house. Uncles, aunts, cousins, people from nearby, all gathered at his house on the top of the hill. I was too young to be present for his passing. I sort of didn't understand what was going on at the time. I was sent down to my grandmother's house to wait for the proceedings to be over. The sun was going down. The mountains were like shadows rising around me. 
Walking alone, I started to hear animals all about, crying out. Wild dogs all over the mountains. Chickens were making a ruckus. The pigs in the lower valley were screaming almost like humans. The cows were howling in a way that I can only describe as similar to Cat Stark from Game of Thrones when Rob died. Every single non-human thing in the mountain with an earshot was wailing in a fashion that I've never heard before or since. As a little kid, you can imagine how frightening that was, especially because I was all alone. I hid in the house, looking out the window, waiting for my grandmother and listening to the animals cry. I was especially sensitive to sound then, as it had been a time in my life where I was often sick and constantly on the medication amoxicillin, which I was allergic to. It created this sort of overwhelming extrasensory sound experience. At some point, all the animals stopped making noise, and I was thankful. Before bed, I asked my grandmother what had happened, why all of the animals were making that sound. She told me that Papito had just died, and that all of the animals on the mountain had realized the powerful being that protected it for so long was gone, that they had seen his spirit pass, and it was sensible that this change would affect them very deeply. My grandmother's perspective was that the animals just know these things. I couldn't sleep. I went outside late at night, curious and scared out of my wits, thinking about the spirits that may be out in the darkness of the mountain wilderness thinking about that terrible, painful lamentation that was embodied by animals crying like people. I went close to the edge of one of the small nearby cliffs that hung over the endless darkness. I squatted and listened. I heard a sound that scared me, a feral cry in the darkness. I don't know what dog it was or if it was a dog at all, but it was certainly too close and I was by myself. It howled and yelped, and I regretted coming outside. I was sort of frozen there, afraid to move, but afraid to stay. I wouldn't dare call out for my grandmother. I would be scolded for coming out and wandering around at night. She probably wouldn't hear me anyway. A moment later, I heard that whistle that Papito used to do, out in the darkness. The howling stopped. As a child, I didn't think... That couldn't be Papito, he's dead. Like any adult in their right mind would think. I just thought, it's Papito. It had to be. No one else could do that. No one knew how to whistle that way in my family, and it was only us for miles around on the mountain. Where the sound came from would have been impossible for any person to be. Not even during the daytime could they be there. It was deep inside of the wilderness on the severe cliffside, but I knew he was there just the same. I'm sure that at that age, the line between life and death was blurred. Yauco is the area where the chief of Taino lived. It is also where the rebellion began against the Spanish, with the drowning of the conquistador Diego Salcedo. Many of the surviving Taino escaped into the mountains of Yauco and lived in secrecy there for a long time hiding their lifestyle behind some of the more assimilated natives, like Papito. They say the Taino are extinct, but that cannot be. I knew some of them, and I am one too, if only a little bit. It was Labor Day of 2015. My mother, my wife, and my three children and I went to a very remote cabin that we rented out. It was an old fire watchman station or something of the sort, so it had the cabin and three other sheds and shops. I'll try to keep this short now, but it's a bizarre story. We unpacked, settled into the cabin, and then decided to walk a couple hundred yards down to the river, barefoot and sandals with shorts for all of us. We got down to the pebbled shore, and were playing and throwing rocks, etc., when I realized that there were one-foot-long snakes everywhere. My wife, my mom, and I yanked up the three kids and boogied off. After reaching a safe distance from them, 
I went back with a water bottle and caught one in it to see what it was. Turns out we were in a nest of diamondback rattlesnakes. If one of those things had latched onto one of my kids, they surely would have died. We were about three hours away from any medical facility. We got back to the cabin and my mom and I went for a hike and a walk alone, while my wife calmed the kiddos and fed them lunch. Upon returning about 15 minutes later, all three of my kids and my wife were inside with the doors and windows all closed up, even though we had had everything open to cool the place off. We went inside to hear all four of them yelling about a bear that was about 150 yards from the cabin, huffing and puffing at the wife and kids on the front porch and eating. It was down by the river, another 30 yards or so down the hill, that he poked his head up and over from. A few hours go by, and in that amount of time, an ATV passes by three times, with two inbred-looking freaks on it. Each time they stopped in front of the gate onto the property and stared at us, or the cabin. Keep in mind that we're two hours into the wilderness in Idaho, with no sight of a person the entire trip except for them. We decide it's bedtime for the kiddos as it's pitch blackout. Within ten minutes, our son, who was five at the time, went from being perfectly fine and active and talkative to having a fever of 103 degrees, slightly foaming at the mouth, and then being completely unresponsive. That was it. We were leaving immediately and going to seek medical attention. I opened the front door to the cabin to start loading the two cars by the light of one porch bulb and the headlights on the cars, which were both parked facing the gate. And that's when all three of us adults heard about four to six large and heavy animals running all around the cabin and the property. There was one on the right side of the house when exiting that I could hear pacing back and forth and breathing heavily. I made everybody stay inside and close the doors every time I went out to transfer stuff to the cars about four or five trips of this. I had a stick and a big pot that I was smacking as hard and as loudly as I could on each trip and I was yelling loudly at random. As soon as I'm done loading, I take each kid out individually and load them up between the two cars. Then I escort my mom and my wife out. My wife and I were in the lead car, so we pulled up out of the gate, and for some stupid reason or another, I felt that I needed to close the gate. So I got out of my vehicle and walked behind it and my mom's car about 15 feet, and I closed the gate. Now, this gate was literally a log that slid from one post to the other. It offered zero protection or barrier between me and whatever was out there. Right as I went to turn around, I heard loud padded footsteps walking up to me, directly in front of me, no more than ten feet. And then, I see eyes shimmering from the moonlight as the deepest, scariest growl I've ever heard in my life emanated. I turned and ran so fast that I swear I must have jumped from where I was to the driver's seat. I landed in the seat and slammed it into drive and spun out, finally leaving. But it gets weirder and scarier. About 15 minutes down the road, we were still panicking about our unresponsive son, and we both kept having this horrible, evil doom feeling, like a shadow was cast over us. I looked down, and I realized that I still had that baby rattlesnake in the water bottle in my cup holder. So I grabbed it and threw it out the window immediately. Not even two minutes later, we hear our son softly crying. We realize he's responsive, and he stated something along the lines of, Why are we leaving? What's going on? He was crying because he didn't want to leave. He couldn't remember the last hour or so. Quick backstory for what's next. My mother was about 58 years old at the time. She's been a Jehovah's Witness my entire life, plus many more years before that and she is the last person in the world to believe in signs or evil spirits or omens or anything of the sort. The next day, my mom completely broke down, sobbing her eyes out, hardly able to talk. She confessed to my wife that the night before we left, she had a nightmare in which we went on the camping trip. We came across snakes, a bear, and a pack of wolves. She said she knew a lot of bad things happened at that outpost and that it was full of evil. Most of all, she said, in my dream, one of your kids died. 
I swear on my life to this very day. If I ask her who died and how it happened, she immediately starts crying and refuses to tell me or anyone. She lives her whole life now with the guilt that she willingly ignored this nightmare and feels like she put us into that danger, nearly taking one of her grandkids away from the world. She doesn't deserve to feel like that. I know this sounds crazy as hell, but a week later, on the local news, there were reports of a wolf pack in the area. Wolves and bears may not coexist in harmony, but as far as I know, they do share territories and respect each other. This outpost station of sorts was about an hour and a half into the wilderness from Loman, Banks, Idaho area. If you want to verify the animals actually exist around there, go for it. Sadly, I grew up in the mountains for most of my pre- and early teen years, as did my wife until she was ten years old. I even have a half-sleeve of the wilderness and trees on my left arm, but with that said, we don't care to go to the mountains anymore. I don't care if you believe me or not. This was and is real to my family, and it did happen to us. That night changed a lot of things going forward. For the past year or so, I have been noticing that things around me don't seem normal anymore. I continue to have this overwhelming sense that everything is fake in a way, or almost dreamlike. I've even kicked around the idea that I may have died already and I'm in some sort of purgatory. I recently took my family on a weekend getaway to Seattle. Being a couple hundred miles away from our home in Sela, Washington, it's an easy trip for my wife and I to manage with our two kids, 11 years old and 4 months old. Over the course of our weekend excursion, I experienced a few things that I found to be odd and left me feeling a bit uneasy. The first occurrence was trivial enough, but it sort of set the tone for the eeriness of the weekend. I was gazing out of the window of our hotel room on the 12th floor, sipping a cup of coffee, when I noticed a plastic bag drifting in the wind. I watched the bag dance around in the air as it slowly descended. A green dumpster 12 stories below me caught my eye, and I immediately thought, what if that bag floated all the way down there and landed in the dumpster? I stood at the window for five minutes or so, watching this bag slowly float toward the ground, gliding left, right, back and forth. The more I watched the bag, the more confident I became that it would find its way into this dumpster, and it did. This bag that I noticed off in the distance drifted 12 stories and perfectly navigated its way into the dumpster below my building. Later that day, I was in the hotel lobby, approaching the elevator to head up to my room. In front of me, there was a man with two children, waiting for the elevator as well. The man had a guitar case strapped to his back, along with an amplifier and various other bags. His back was to me, and he had a hoodie on. For some reason, I thought to myself, what if that's Ed? Ed was a friend of mine that I hadn't seen in years. We used to work at an olive garden together in our younger days. We also played guitar together and did a fair amount of partying. Now here's the weird part. My wife thinks I'm crazy, but bear with me. The weird part was how confident I was that this guy was going to turn around and it would be Ed. The same confidence, almost certainty I would say, that I had had in the fact that the trash bag would fly into the dumpster. The elevator doors opened and this man and his two children walked inside. As the man turned around to enter the floor number on the elevator button console, it was Ed. We were both thrilled to see each other, and we even held the door open to chat for a moment, hindering other folks in the process. Even as this was all occurring though, I couldn't shake the feeling, this isn't real. It's a very difficult thing to describe, but things just don't feel real. Later that evening, my 11-year-old son and I were on the balcony outside of our hotel room. He was peering over the edge when he suddenly whimpered under his breath, that poor guy. 
When I asked him who and what he was talking about, he said, That bumblebee on the ground next to the dumpster, he's dead. We were on the 12th floor, like I mentioned earlier. There's no way that this kid could see a dead bumblebee on the ground floor. Not to mention that the alleged bee was laying next to the dumpster that was the manifested landing zone for the floating trash bag. We argued a bit over whether or not he could really see this bee when he finally convinced me to go down and take a look. As we made our way down to the street level, my thought process shifted. The same confidence that I had previously had regarding the trash bag and Ed had returned. Although I didn't mention it to my son, I became increasingly certain that the bee would be there. And well, it was. It was right there, right next to the green dumpster containing the trash sack. The next evening, I took the family to a place called Gameworks, which is similar to Dave and Buster's, or an adult version of Chuck E. Cheese. I placed our car keys, wallets, and other important things all into our diaper bag and backpack that we carried on into the establishment. We spent a couple of hours playing games before finally counting our tickets and claiming prizes at the prize booth. We pocketed the prizes and went down the block to the Cheesecake Factory for dinner. After being seated for a few moments, my wife realizes that I don't have the backpack on. The backpack, containing all of our money, credit cards, car keys, not to mention food and supplies for our four-month-old baby. The bizarre thing is that I have no recollection of ever taking that bag off, but apparently I did because it was gone. But I could have sworn up and down that I never took it off. I immediately go into panic mode, leap up from the table, and take off toward the GameWorks establishment. I run inside and dart around frantically for about a minute or two, with the bag nowhere in sight. Finally, I calm down and focus. After breathing and focusing for a moment, I'm greeted with that same confidence that I mentioned before. I was confident that I would not leave that place without my bag. At that moment, a man approached me waving his arms in the air and calling me by my first name. He said, here, Cody, I've got your bag, man. Now get back to that cheesecake factory and enjoy your dinner. I was awestruck and definitely beside myself at that moment. I had no clue who this man was or how he knew my name or where I was eating dinner. I didn't even think to question him. I just reached out, grabbed the bag and left. This might seem coincidental to a lot of you, but these are just recent examples of how my life seems to unfold lately. Either I'm a walking conduit of coincidence or something larger is at play. My wife thinks I'm nuts, but things are definitely not the same as they used to be. I don't know exactly how or why, but they just aren't. Things just don't seem real, and I can't tell you why. My wife and I moved into a 110-year-old house about six months ago. We've always been fans of the paranormal, and on my days off from work, we generally binge watch YouTube channels like Shane Dawson, Top 15s, Chills, Lazy Masquerade, etc. We find it fun to be scared, but it's rare that you come across something truly paranormal. So we try to seek it out. However, the next part we weren't necessarily seeking out, which makes it pretty odd. We came across a video which talked about Dybbuk boxes. We did our own research and found that though this is supposed to be an ancient tradition, we could only find references to it starting a few years ago, almost like a marketing gimmick. For those who are unfamiliar, it's a box or a wine cabinet from the Jewish tradition, which traps malevolent spirits or entities. Mostly, we just found videos of people opening them on YouTube, boxes that they'd bought from eBay or from some other mysterious seller. 
We got the idea to make some side cash from this and decided to sell our own Dybbuk boxes. We knew that it was mostly bullshit and people were buying it for the experience. Not because they truly believed in it, but because they wanted to open up something spooky for their YouTube followers for likes. We went in understanding this, sort of a mutual social contract. We got started by buying old boxes from estate sales, and we wanted to make sure that it was as authentic as possible. Just because we all know it's fake doesn't mean that we should half-ass it. We wanted to create a genuine feel to the box. We bought old funeral candles on eBay, found creepy old dolls at local thrift stores, went the whole nine yards. We live in Dayton, Ohio, down the street from where the Wright brothers are buried at the Woodland Cemetery. It's less than a mile away. We scooped up some old dirt from that cemetery, which is pretty old if you feel like some light reading. Apparently it's supposed to be haunted, like a lot of things in Ohio. We even went with the box to a few other haunted areas, like the Amber Rose and the Ye Old Tavern in Yellow Springs. Finally, after bringing it to our local haunts, we felt that we had done enough to invite whatever we could into the box. Even though we didn't believe in this, we seriously gave it our best effort, since people are paying actual money for these things. So we filled the box with dirt, an old creepy doll, and an old photo of a little girl that we found in a book at an estate sale. We sealed it with wax and wrapped it in twine. And that was that. Up until this point, despite our house being very old, we had no inclination that it was haunted or out of the ordinary in any way, despite our hoping that it was when we moved in. I mean, we bought a 110-year-old house. We wanted something to get our money's worth. The night we wrapped the box was like any other, nothing to report. But the following day, weird stuff started to happen. When I first moved in, my bike was stolen right off my porch. Like, someone had to physically reach over my porch and take my bike in broad daylight. I remember thinking, what the hell? I thought the Midwest was friendly. So, I installed cameras all over my house, inside and out. I also bought a gun, because I have a little girl and I'm not going to mess around. I feel like saying that is important, because the next day, after wrapping the box, the TV started turning on and off without warning usually when we weren't watching it, but simply walking by it. This wasn't someone with a different remote or energy settings on the cable box or TV. We started to finally hear the loud creaking sounds you hear about with old houses. This could have been because of the weather, it had started to change, but it was just such weird timing. We also started to hear knocks on the front door, and we get a lot of packages, so this isn't out of the ordinary. But when we opened the door, no one was there, and the cameras we have reflected that. Even worse, with our new alarm system, it alerts us when a door opens in the house. So, late in the evening one day before we set it, we heard, back door, open. So I grab my gun and look at the cameras on my phone. Nothing. Just the back door, wide open, after I locked it. I cautiously go downstairs to the basement, gun in hand, search it, and still come up empty. I rewatched the cameras and the door seemingly just opened by itself, but it's not clear enough to see if the lock turned before it was swung open. I could have forgotten to lock it, I guess, but that's not like me. And sure, the wind may have opened it too, but again, very unlikely. My daughter's toys also seem to turn themselves on downstairs or up in her room, even though she is asleep beside us. I know kids' toys can do that, but coupled with everything else, it's just a little bizarre. The creepiest things, though, are what I can see. I have a yucca plant, and I placed it by the window, where the stairs have a 90-degree angle. I can see the window from my bed. We sleep with the door open. And, lately, I've woken up to see the same figure standing by that window, blocking the light. People have suggested that it may be a shadow, 
or a hallucination. But a shadow doesn't get bigger and closer every day, and a hallucination wouldn't be confined to one spot. It's not carbon monoxide poisoning because I have sensors for that with my alarm. I even double check them. This is something that I can very clearly see in the middle of the night. It's boxy, like a fridge, and if I blink a few times it will go away, or if I turn on the lights, but I can almost always count on seeing it. It doesn't feel like I'm just waking up on my own, either. I feel like it's waking me up, like it wants me to see it. Every night, or other night, it seems like it gets a little closer as well, and now I'm worried about what might happen if it ever reaches me. Firstly, I will mention this didn't happen in an actual castle, but instead was an old Victorian hospital or workhouse. The property still has the name castle in it, so I call it my castle story. So in South Wales, I want to say in around 2011, I can't quite remember, as I would have been around 10 or 11 years old. This was a family holiday with my siblings and our family friends, which we call auntie and uncle, etc., because we're that close. It also involved all of the children who were around my age. In total, there were about 10 of us. I've never really been somebody to believe in the paranormal, but I would say that this is the only thing that would lean me toward it. The people who own the property are a couple, one of which is the sibling of a family friend we are staying with, and they are lovely. However, I cannot seem to get my head around how comfortable they are with this sort of thing. I also forgot to mention that this was a weekend surrounding Halloween time, which only intensifies the creepy aspect of this ordeal. On the first night, I was the only one out of the ten of us who was actually terrified of the house itself. There was no central heating, no internet, as you can imagine in an old Victorian building. It was just creepy. As we sat at the table eating dinner, the owner, who lives in a lovely cottage right next to the building, came over to make sure we had everything we needed and to wish us a good night. She could tell that I was very distressed and tried to see what the matter was. I imagine she already had a very clear idea. I refused to tell her and began to get really emotional just from the fact that I was so scared. My mum explained that I was terrified and that my mind was probably just playing tricks on itself. Our host then went on to say, there's no one here that will hurt you. The next thing she said properly scared me and I can still remember the sense of dread that came over me despite being told it wasn't negative. She went on to say, the only other thing here is the little girl and she is ever so friendly. Can you imagine being that scared on Halloween weekend and then you're told that the place in which you're spending the next few nights has a ghost girl in it? After she told everyone this, I have to say the mood definitely changed. Even the adults were a bit like, hang on a second, what did she just say? The host reassured us that it was nothing to worry about and that her daughters used to speak to her through the walls all the time. I remember the other kids my age were a bit worried at this point, so their dad offered to take anyone who wanted upstairs to walk around and let them know that they were completely safe. It goes without saying that I was the only one who did not go. Over the next few hours, everyone relaxed by the fire and then all headed to bed. I remember the layout of the house like it's my own, despite being there for only two days almost ten years ago. I had asked my mom to stay with me until I fell asleep, and then she would go stay in the end room with my sisters. They are marginally younger than me and, embarrassingly, were managing to sleep on their own just fine. My mom did so, and I fell asleep fine. I remember waking up and feeling at ease, but I wasn't ready for what came the next night. We had a day doing tourist things, and 
I remember that this was actually Halloween day. So when we came home, we got dressed and did the whole trick or treat thing around the surrounding village. I remember walking back to the house on the cold, dark Halloween night up to the old bendy spooky road you take up to the house and being greeted by this black obelisk we were sleeping in. This night started like the one before. We got cozy by the fire, the adults had a drink, and then we headed to bed. I was woken up at around two in the morning when I heard the sound of scratching and tapping coming from the ceiling. It was one of those moments when you wake up suddenly and you try to get your bearings, but everything around you is just disorienting. This scratching was constant and horrific, so I plucked up enough courage to run down the narrow, dark hallway, which stretched the whole length of the house to where my mum was sleeping. I got in the bed and tried to forget what I'd heard. When I woke up in the morning, it was pretty much eat breakfast and say goodbye and then leave as we had quite a long drive home. I remember driving back, I was told two things. It was like the good news and bad news cliche. My mom firstly told me the reason I was woken up and could hear scratching was because the roof was so old the ravens had made their way in and had started to nest. I remember this settled me. However, what came next truly still spooks me. My mom told me she had asked a family member back home to do some research on the building to see what the history was, but not to tell her until we left. She then went on to say that the castle is actually haunted by this little girl who would often run down the hallways. Of course, it's up to you if you believe in that sort of thing. But she went on to say that on both nights, she heard consistent running up the hall every few hours or so. She went on to say that she would often come to check on me to see if I had gotten up, but I was fast asleep. She was in the same room as my siblings, so it couldn't have been them. I have absolutely no explanation other than it could have been the birds, but I highly doubt it. I proceeded to quiz her and say, are you absolutely sure that it was footsteps? And although I was young, I remember her being very genuine. It was footsteps. This might seem like a mixture of an older spooky place and a frightened child's mind, but I can still remember all of it as clear as day. I was told the girl was probably looking to play with my siblings and I, and that's why she was running around but it still freaks me out to this very day. It started when I was very young. To this day, my parents remember me always screaming in the night for them to come to me. The first encounter I can remember was when I was a kid. I remember getting ready for my first day of school. At the time, we were living on post at Fort Sam. I remember waking up at 5 a.m. to get dressed for school, and I heard this loud, strange humming noise coming from outside my window. When I opened the window, I saw this large silver UFO. I can remember this very vividly till this day. It was so large that it covered the whole window the only thing I could see of it was the silver aluminum from the ship. It had white lights on top and these light blue lights at the underside of the ship. It freaked me out. I slammed my blind shut and screamed for my dad. When he came in, I told him what I had seen. He laughed and opened the blinds and of course, nothing was there. From that day on, I had constant nightmares. Nightmares that felt like real life. I could never understand anything they said, but they could understand me. I remember in one dream I would try and scream for help before they took me with them, and I would be paralyzed and unable to scream for help. I wouldn't be able to get my parents' attention when they took me. They would put me on this examination table and just look at me as they were studying me. They never did me harm, they just observed. I remember being in my early teens, still having these same dreams. I finally built up the courage to speak with them. 
I remember the first time I was 12. They took me as usual, but this time I just let them. I had a strange, calm feeling this time when they put me on the table. I asked them exactly what they were trying to do. The one alien told me they were trying to figure out how to make humans live forever. They then asked if I felt safe, and I told them that I did. I asked if they would mind showing me around their ship. I don't remember many details, but the ones I do remember is seeing other people, human beings, examined. One was undergoing surgery. They then took me to the command center, which had a lot of big monitors with strange writings, and underneath the floor, it was like glass so you could see through it. I was so amazed, because I could see Earth, and it looked so beautiful. They could read my mind and tell that I was pleased, and I told them that they were free to let me come with them, as I wanted to learn more about them. For a while I would go back, and instead of being examined, they would just take me around the ship. I met a few different aliens, three to be exact. Their faces were slim, and they were bright green in color, very skinny and long arms and legs. They wore nothing, and they seemed to really grow on me. We started to develop a friendship of sorts. I was able to start understanding what they were telling me clearly, but it wasn't speech. It was telepathic communication, with me speaking out loud to them. One time, they took me into a big green field that was like a maze. It was not on Earth. I'm not sure where it was exactly, but it was very peaceful. Nothing was there but hedges and fields of grass. We talked there two times, and the third time we talked there, they told me that they would now have to leave me for a while, and that I would only see them one more time after this. The last time I would encounter them was very, very strange. They picked me up that night. I was laying in bed, and this time I was back on the examination table. I saw one of my friends and I asked him what was going on. He told me not to be scared, but that they wanted to test something on me, and if I was okay with it, they would be unable to see me ever again. I was very sad and told him that I didn't want to lose them as we were very close. He told me that this was very important to them and that they could really use my help, and that it could change the future of their research. I was 14 by this time. I agreed, and then another alien that I didn't know had me follow him to this pod. It was egg-shaped and silver and had bright red lights around it, and had a chair inside. The glass that would normally cover it was open. I sat in the chair. I was scared. There were large, sharp objects hanging from inside. They looked like drills and saws. I asked him for my friend, and two of my friends showed up. They held my hand and promised me that I would be safe. The other friend behind him reassured me that his words were true. The alien had a long needle in his hand, which was about the size of a large medical syringe. It was maybe two inches long, and there was this neon green fluid inside of the syringe. I asked if it was going to hurt, and they told me that yes, but to remember that I was helping them. I asked them what it was, and they said they would tell me after they were done. So I was ready, and they could tell, so they injected the fluid into my left arm. It hurt a lot. I was crying, and they could tell that I was in pain, but shortly after, it subsided. I noticed three big green fluid-filled blisters on my arm, and then he told me. What they had injected into me was the serum that would make you live for eternity. They told me that I shouldn't tell anybody what they did, because it was very secret. My two friends gave me a last hug goodbye, and the one that had given me the shot waved goodbye as they sent me back home, where I woke up in bed. When I woke up, I rolled over and looked at my arm. And I kid you not, there were three green welts on my arm. When I put my finger on it, it popped, and green fluid came out onto my bed sheets. I popped all three. I was kind of scared and I yelled for my dad, and he ran in and saw my arm and rushed me to the ER. I didn't want to tell the doctors what had really happened out of fear of them thinking I was crazy, so I just said I had no idea what happened, that I had woken up with them on my arm and popped them. The doctors took samples and prescribed me some chemical burn cream to put on them. I still have three circular scars on my left arm, and they're very faint now, but they stayed visible for years. I always wanted to share this, 
I have no idea why they were so nice to me and why they chose me for this experiment. I never saw them again after that and everything stopped. I just thought it was strange. In a weird way, I missed them too. I wish them well, and I would like to think that maybe I did do something to help mankind in the future. But whatever it was, I was glad I could help them at all. I grew up in a house that was built in 1902. I was born in the late 80s, so the house had been remodeled a few times. It was a two-story house with three bedrooms and a tiny bathroom on the second floor. The bathroom was at the top of the stairs, and my room was across the hall at kind of an angle. My sister and my parents had rooms farther down a long, narrow hallway. For as long as I can remember, I saw a ghost I called her Pam. My mom told me that I began talking about Pam around the age of five and that I never stopped. My mom never believed any of this and just brushed it off as my wild imagination. Pam was pink and transparent, a see-through, totally pink little girl, maybe eight or nine years old. She knew that I could see her and I knew that she could see me, but she never made a sound, ever, nothing. She walked around only the upstairs and never came down the steps. Honestly, I have no idea where the name Pam came from. Growing up, Pam would sit at the top of the stairs, waiting for me to run up to the bathroom after I got home from school. I would walk around her because she was always there, every day. If she wasn't sitting on the step, she would just be sitting on a bed or standing in one of the rooms or the hallway harmless for the most part. However, if I ignored her, she would mess up my bedroom while I was gone doing my paper route. When I would get back home, my parents would be all sorts of angry over my messy room. But if I just said a quick hi, she wouldn't mess with me. She never touched me, and I also never physically saw her move anything with my own eyes. But I would get really scared and nauseous every time she would destroy my room behind my back. So I learned very quickly to say hi to her every day. At the age of 15, my mom put me into therapy because I was still bringing up Pam here and there. Pam was still always around. I was used to her and she wasn't doing anything. So she didn't come up in conversations as often. Therapy helped, but not with Pam. When I was 17, my parents decided to put our house up for sale. I don't know if it was all the people walking through or me packing up my stuff, but something triggered Pam and it got real crazy. About a month before our new house was built and ready to be moved into, I was asleep in my room. My bed was against the wall and I could lie on my side and see right into the bathroom. While asleep, I had a dream of Pam, still transparent, standing in the doorway of the bathroom. She pointed up and for the first time in my life, I heard her talk. She said, look, that's my mom. I sat up in bed and from the light fixture saw a dark haired woman hanging lifelessly by a rope. Her boot fell off of her foot and hit the floor and I woke up. Holy crap. I couldn't say anything because my family never saw her. They didn't understand. Pam wasn't in their lives like she was in mine. I didn't really dwell too much on it. It was a dream, right? Pam was back to sitting on the top step the next day, life as usual. But two weeks later, I had another dream. It started out exactly like the first one. The bathroom light was on and I could kind of see into it while laying down on the bed. But this time I heard a weird grunting and splashing. I sat up and saw clear as day, the woman that had been hanging from the light fixture was not only alive, but was holding Pam, no longer translucent, under the water in our bathtub. She was drowning Pam in our bathtub. I don't have any idea what made me wake up, but I could not contain my emotion. 
I ran down the hall and jumped into my parents' bed as a 17-year-old. It was just my mom in there. I think my dad fell asleep on the couch or something. But I was hysterical. I told my mom everything through tears and gasps for air. My mom didn't know what to say. Then, in the middle of my sadness, Pam walked into the doorframe of my parents' bedroom. She was transparent again. I quickly laid down really close to my mom and pulled the covers over my head. I just remember saying, Oh my gosh, mom, she's in here. I held my breath, and seconds later, I felt cold, small hands on my back, shoving me against my mom. I kept yelling, stop touching me. My mom could only reply with, I'm not touching you. This went on for what felt like forever, but was probably only a matter of seconds. When she stopped, she just stood there at the side of the bed, staring at me. She didn't move. I pulled the covers over my head again, and I ended up crying myself to sleep while my mom held me. We were both shaking horribly. I moved all of my stuff out the next day, and I slept on the floor of our unfinished house the next few nights until my bedroom was done. I never went back. Shortly after my family moved out completely, and before the next buyers moved in, the entire back of the house and the entire garage went up in flames. The official cause was listed as spontaneous combustion. The first people to buy and sell the house after us lasted 10 months there. They called my parents to tell them that they couldn't keep the window or closet door shut in the room with the black carpeting. That was my bedroom. I saw the house posted a couple of months ago on Zillow and the only picture of my room shows the door open a crack. You can see a bit of the black carpeting, but there's nothing in the room. The rest of the house is furnished. I've tried so hard to find any information about the girl that's in my old house, but there's almost no information at all, just basic architecture and lot line documents. It's the craziest story, but this was my childhood. Part of me feels sorry for Pam, but another part of me knows that there's something strong and dark in that house. I know Pam loved me in a way, but there's no way I would ever go back. This experience has left me feeling extremely shaken, and I would love some opinions, especially from somebody with experience. Last year, I had a very strange experience in a national forest out in California. I was by myself on a road trip with my dog, and I was driving pretty far into Mendocino National Forest. I like to camp in national parks and forests because it's isolated, so my dog can roam and they're free of charge a trade-off for sketchy and rough drives into the park sometimes, and a lack of service and assistance. Anyway, I was driving up this dirt road, kind of curling up a mountain, around maybe 5 p.m. It was very nice out, sunny and warm with a slight breeze. Nothing serious happened, but I felt extremely uncomfortable driving into the area, and that feeling did not let up. Driving up the mountain, I felt like I shouldn't stay there, and I even texted my boyfriend about it, for as long as I could, before my phone completely lost service. I was looking for a sign of another person having been around the area lately, but I didn't see anything. I pulled over and got out of my car with my dog to look over the edge, and I noticed a dead squirrel and some broken glass mixed in with the dirt and gravel road. Yucca, my dog, started to growl slightly. She is vocal, but I have almost only ever seen or heard her growl at or with other dogs. I did see her growl at a possum once, so it could be something she smelled, maybe. This place continued to make me feel quite on edge, but I pride myself on being an independent traveler and backpacker, so I decided to continue at least a bit further with my grumbling pup to see if I could find a good place to camp. I continue to notice more and more dead animals, 
Keep in mind, no one's going to be driving more than 5 to 10 miles per hour up this thing, and that's if there's even anybody out there. I hear men's voices. They sound close, and I think that I should call out to them, so I stop my car. But then I kind of freeze up and feel like I shouldn't. I can't really make out what they're saying. I don't see any sign of people anywhere. I get back in my car and continue to slowly drive forward and cautiously look for where the voices could be coming from. I've never run into other people in a national park or forest when I've gone in this deep. The unsettling feeling grows about these voices, which have sort of come and gone a few times, and I give up and begin to turn my car around. I honestly don't even remember how Yucca was acting on the way down. I was scared and focused on getting out of there. I just distinctly remember being surprised at her grumbling when we were standing outside of my car. A bit dangerously fast for the road, I went back down the mountain not seeing any sign of anybody. I decided to spring for luxury and get a hotel for the night. I figured I was just fine. Huge and open spaces can be intimidating, I told myself, and the voices could have been echoing from somewhere far off and they just sounded close. Animals die glass gets broken. Nothing happened. Cool. But I remember this place. It sticks with me. Whenever I'm watching scary movies, if I'm walking my dog in the woods at night, nothing compares to the feeling I had driving up that mountain. And it's honestly kind of interesting to me, as well as frightening. I recently happened across some information, as well as some Native American lore, that made me feel extremely uneasy. Fast forward a year, I've mentioned this place to a few people and the haunting vibes that it gave me, but nothing much more. I googled the national park once and didn't see anything, but I didn't look much either. I like scary movies and things of that nature, hence my fascination with this little event. So my boyfriend and I were coming up on finishing our road trip just yesterday. We were in Wyoming for a wedding. There were only two to three hours left, and the sun had set, so we decided to listen to some scary podcasts and YouTube videos. We went from the No Sleep podcast to the X-Files and ended up on a true story video dealing with Native American lore. I'm half paying attention, petting my dog, playing Pokemon on an emulator, and I hear the narrator mention Wendigos. Very briefly says what they are, and casually mentions that they can mimic voices. I mean it when I say the most horrible chills I've ever had in my life crawled down my spine. I stare at my boyfriend and I ask him if he remembers that national forest that I was freaked out about last year. He says he does and he reminds me that he texted me that I was probably close to a Wendigo. I remember him saying that, but I didn't know much about their lore and I thought he was just being funny like, haha, yeah, Bigfoot is stalking you, or some other dad joke. And he was like, no, I mean, I was mostly joking, but I said it specifically because you said you were hearing voices that you could find no trace of. I started to feel super strange, and I began googling Wendigos and things like that. They are allegedly able to mimic human voices, and they would live in that sort of area. It all matched up. Obviously, there is a ton of questionable information out there, but I tried to find more reputable websites and authentic experiences. I then specifically looked up missing persons in the area, and the first headline that catches my eye is, Another Family Goes Missing in Mendocino. I went through different websites and news articles of people going missing, but they're all a little bit hidden underneath national park websites and pictures of trees. I remembered looking up the forest about a year ago, but I didn't see anything. And I realized that these stories didn't seem to be talked about very much, which also piqued my intuition and interest. It was stated that well over 100 people in the past eight years have gone missing and not been found out there, on top of the many which are found dead. It just has my interest super spiked, remembering how unsafe I felt, how badly I wanted to get out of there terrifies me, and I felt so uneasy about what I was hearing, and I do to this day. My dog and I are very close. She was a stray that started following one day, and I ended up bringing her home from Costa Rica. 
So her little growls along the way make me feel like there was something wrong. Even though it was just a storytelling video, these stories originate from somewhere, right? This story is a few years old now, but it's interesting nonetheless. This involves what I believe to have been a poltergeist. I was already very interested in spirits and had attempted to communicate with them various times. This is the first and only time that communication was successful. To protect mine and others' identities, the names in this story are fake. Every other detail, however, is completely true. When I had just turned 19 years old, I moved out of my grandparents' house for the first time with my best friend Alex and my ex-boyfriend Tim. Alex's son would be at the house every other week because Alex was separated from his mother. Let's call the kid Rex. Rex was a very cool kid. He was only three years old, but was still able to beat me at Mario Kart Double Dash, which I grew up on. Because he was so smart, Alex didn't question it when Rex would talk to himself, because apparently a lot of smart kids do this. One day, being the self-proclaimed ghost hunter that I am, I asked who he was talking to. Rex looks back in the direction he was originally talking and then back to me after about five seconds. Nobody, he said, and went back to talking quietly and playing. Tim and I exchanged freaked out looks, but Alex exclaimed, see, he's not talking to anybody. I didn't buy it, despite him still being a close friend. A few weeks go by and I find myself babysitting Rex, alone at the house. He was playing outside, on our carport that we turned into a porch. I told him it was time to go inside so that I could make him lunch. He sat at the dining room table and I sat in the living room next to the door to the carport. I'm scrolling through Facebook when all of a sudden I hear one of Rex's toys start singing. I peep out the blinds on the window of the door and I couldn't see anything that would make it go off. I figured it was a squirrel and sat back down. Not a minute later, it started singing again. I opened my camera app on my phone and began recording. It didn't stop until Rex came into the living room to proclaim that he was done with his sandwich and was ready to go back outside and play. I compromised with him into watching something on Netflix instead, without giving away any details. I ended up brushing it off thinking maybe somehow the button was stuck. Another week or so goes by. I'm home alone, as I had a day off from my job at Pizza Hut, but the guys were at work. I was doing the dishes in the kitchen. Our kitchen was pretty nice. A nice fridge on the opposite side of the kitchen than the sink had liquor bottles on top of it, sat toward the back of the fridge. As I was listening to music and finishing up, a bottle flew off the fridge and smashed into the opposite wall. I waited in Tim and I's bedroom until Alex got home and explained what happened. He said it was probably sitting up there for so long that it found its way to the edge. I became quite scared of whatever was going on at this point, but my ex and best friend were signed on to the lease and anything beat living with my grandparents again even though I ultimately moved back home. Yet another week goes by and I'm out delivering pizzas. I rode by the house fairly often on my routes, because we lived next door to the strip my store was in. I glanced over on this particular day and saw a raggedy lady standing outside our carport door. She was wearing tattered clothing and her hair was curly and unbrushed. She was just standing there staring at the door. I immediately called Alex, maybe three seconds after seeing her. He answered immediately. 
I told him to go look out the door at the carport, and he did without question. He said, I don't see anything, and I explained to him what I saw. He didn't know what to think of it. At this point, I was seriously concerned. I began stating we needed to protect the house and wore a blessed necklace a friend of mine from college had made for me. The last experience I had in this house isn't the reason I moved out, but happened shortly before I did. I went to sleep early one night, being high off my ass. I normally wouldn't go to sleep without Tim because of the events that had been happening. I left the door cracked open and a small standard nightlight on to give me peace of mind. About three minutes after falling asleep, my eyes dart open. I realized I had fallen asleep on my back, which often leads to minor sleep paralysis for me. I had taught myself a trick, wiggling my toes to get out of it. But no matter how much I wiggled my toes this time, I couldn't get out of it. I then heard the door creak open. I was relieved because I thought it was Tim. But when you're paralyzed in your sleep, it's never what you want it to be. The raggedy lady I had seen outside of my carport door glided to the corner of my bed. I couldn't see any details of her face. It was like someone had shaded it out with a pencil. She was wearing the same tattered striped shirt, and what I could now see was a long black skirt. I want to speak to the boy, she said. I'm not sure if I actually said anything to tell her okay, as I was mortified. But sure enough, Rex, who was in the room over, glided into the room next to her, and I woke up. I immediately bolted out of bed and opened Rex's bedroom door. He was muttering in his sleep. I told Alex and Tim what happened immediately, but neither of them seemed concerned. None of us live in that house anymore. And Alex has told me that Rex no longer talks to himself. Go figure. I never saw the raggedy lady again. And I hope I never do.